Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to In the Clouds here on Red Hat Live Streaming. I am Chris Short, host of the most. Uh, today, we are talking about data science and how data science can improve your business. So I've brought on, you may know her from the data services office hour, Sophie Watson, and uh, I will let everybody do their introductions here shortly, and Mike Peach, who are both uh, part of our AIML team here at Red Hat and have a lot to talk about today. So pick an order, any order, and introduce yourselves, please. Mike, after you. Oh, well, okay. Otherwise, we'll just get metastable and go back and forth 17 or 18 times. So uh, I'm Mike Peach, uh, Vice President General Manager of the Data Services Business Unit here at Red Hat. Um, we are working on a number of uh, exciting offerings uh, in the uh, wide world of data services on the cloud uh, coming forth um, starting uh, within a few weeks and going on for uh, hopefully a very uh, great long time. But uh, the, the sort of the flagship for the foreseeable future really is OpenShift Data Science. Um, and we'll get more into what that's all about over the, the, the coming minutes here. Um, but it is a uh, it is an offering uh, hosted uh, on top of uh, Amazon Web Services and soon to be other uh, cloud um, infrastructures as well. It is based on the open source project called Open Data Hub. We'll talk more about that as well. Um, and it is really meant to bring to uh, the industry, to the Red Hat um, kind of community and customer base and folks that we haven't even started to talk to yet, um, the uh, ability to bring data science and uh, more specifically machine learning into your everyday enterprise applications. And uh, so that's what we're really excited to talk about here today. I've been at Red Hat for eight and a half years. so. Um, uh, managing, uh, among other things, our middleware business unit for a while. So my own background really is on the um, enterprise application development side of things, um, uh, though a long time sort of uh, passionate aficionado of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning um, uh, in which my esteemed colleague, Sophie Watson, is a much deeper expert and I will hand it over uh, to Sophie. Thanks, Mike. Um, hey, everyone. I'm Sophie. I'm a principal data scientist here at Red Hat. Um, I am really interested in how we can make data scientists' lives easier and better. So how can we make sure that you can use all of that data science knowledge you have and effectively see it through to fruition as part of a larger application? So drawing on all of, you know, Mike's knowledge and his team's knowledge around applications and open shift and all the good things like that. How can we get data scientists to leverage that without having to become experts in that infrastructure? That's awesome and great introductions. So thank you for that. Um, we have a icebreaker question and I know Sophie, you said this was whack, but Cake or pie? Is cheesecake a cake or a pie? Sophie has the strongest opinion, I feel like. I mean, is it is it baked? Yes. Cheesecake well, is baked. Well, then it's a custard. Hmm. Okay. Mike, what say you? Yeah, I you know, I, I saw that question uh in the uh in the in the prep notes and I thought about it. Um I hadn't obviously been uh posed that particular question before and I thought, oh clearly it's a cake. What's the what's the what's the problem? It's kind of cakey. I mean, one might call into question the fact that it's a little gooier than a typical cake. However, um and I started thinking about the characteristics that uh led me so quickly to to knee jerk the answer cake um so one of the the aspects is there's a there's a there's a um there's a proportion right there's a this there's, there's a size of a typical cheesecake and it is um typically the proportions of a cake rather than a pie a cake right. is sort of taller and uh relative to its diameter whereas a pie is uh is thin relative to its um its diameter the interior of a pie typically is uh, somewhat translucent, though I know there are some nut pies that don't don't quite check that box. Whereas the the cheese cake is, you know, like cakes, it is um, it is quite opaque. So um, 
you know, those were a couple of things that jumped to mind. And honestly, the whole train of thought really highlighted for me this notion of attributes and what attributes matter in determining the outcome or, or the categorization of a of a thing in question. And uh, I thought it was very uh, uh, cleverly posed as a question at the beginning of a uh, discussion about data science. So um, <laughs> hats off to you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems to work in a lot of use cases. So uh, that's just my favorite dessert. So we asked the simple question and that's how we came up with that icebreaker question. But let's get on to the, the meat of the conversation here. How do you get data science into your organization? Where do you start? Yeah, so I'll, I'll give the I'll I'll give my sort of pointy hair boss type of answer, and then mm -hmm. then we'll let Sophie give the real answer because she actually does this every day. <laughs> um, but you know my my sort of I'll say ideal or imagined ideal scenario of how this uh, would work in a typical enterprise, a typical big business who isn't necessarily. Uh, a technology company per se, right? It could be anything from, you know, uh, uh, consumer products, food products. It could be, um, you know, manufacturing, which has technology, but a different kind of technology from the technology that we kind of um, trade in here. But anyway, I imagine uh, a, uh, a, you know, a, a decision maker, a, a business owner or somebody with a, you know, a, let's, without getting into titles and hierarchy and so on, somebody with enough sort of scope of, of responsibility that, uh, the, you know, they are, they are making decisions about how to innovate, where to go next, how to compete with their competitors. Um, and uh, clearly, in, unless, uh, you know, one has, uh, you know, disappeared to another planet for a while and uh, not, not read any media for a while, they, they have, of, of course, heard some references to machine learning and data science. They're certainly quite topical buzzwords, but they might wonder, okay, well, what is it really? How does it work? And how could it help me? I got to imagine that there are probably some, uh, some software, some IT type folks in, as there are in any enterprise, any enterprise above a, a big scale, uh, a, a critical threshold these days, um, there's going to be some computer uh, folks um, kind of in the milieu somewhere. Um, and I imagine that decision maker would sort of open a conversation like, okay, how could this help? And right. I think it's fairly um, straightforward to throw out a couple of examples ago. Oh, wow, that sounds, that sounds really compelling. That sounds quite doable. And yeah, maybe there's a lot of fancy rocket science under the hood, but the way you're telling it to me, um, you know, so-and-so that could, that could, that could really help. So how do we get, so can you show me, right? So right. that, can you show me that, can you do a demo? Um, that to me is that, that magic moment where you get some folks in a room around a table who aren't necessarily computer people and go, wow, how did that work? And that's where, um, I would hand it off to Sophie because she does demos like that on a regular basis, has seen the lit up faces in the room when somebody understands, oh my God, you can do that? That's what data science does? Um, and I think that puts in motion, um, you know, experimentation, trials, and then, okay, how do we make this go to production? So that's my fantasy. Let me, let me, uh, let me have that sort of recalibrated and, uh, and, and brought back down to earth by somebody who really does it. <laughs> I think that's a, a great start, Mike. I see it as there being kind of two angles to how we get machine learning and data science and intelligence into um, companies and into, you know, general organizations. I think the first angle that you've got to think about is, well, where can I actually benefit from data science? You've got mm -hmm. to stop and think, you know, what, uh, what are we doing that we could... Um, add some intelligence to from a machine so are there any human processes where humans are making decisions could that be done by machine learning or um, data science and then on the other hand there's how, how do you actually do that okay it's fine to say okay right. let's put some data science over here problem solved the world is a better place but how how do you get that in there um and the implementation and getting things 
integrated into systems, I think is really the tough bit. So it involves a lot of uh, conversations between cross-functional teams. Not only do you have the stakeholders that say, hey, we could get machine learning in here and solve this problem, but you've also got the data scientists that actually build those models and the pipelines. And then you've got the application developers as well who are concerned with you know, making it work in practice. You've got all these other personas around that. Perhaps you've got IT ops managing environments for all of these different personas who have different skills, different needs, um, data engineers, and so on. We could talk all day about the moving parts of a machine learning system. But yeah, so I think there's two things. You've got to think, okay, what's the least, what's the, what's the smallest problem I could possibly add some machine intelligence to? And then how are we going to enable people to actually do that? And I think that all starts with a platform. Yeah. And, you know, Mike, a platform that brings us to Red Hat OpenShift Data Science. Do you want to talk about what that is to some extent at this point? Yeah, I I think Sophie just uh, set it up and and segued beautifully. Um, It's easy to get caught up in the, as I already mentioned the magic of the the moment of an initial demo or initial even without a demo an epiphany a sort Mm -hmm. of enlightenment of oh that's that's what machine learning does and oh that's how it might help my i don't know my customer support operation or my um you know you know my online you know commerce uh, application that uh that i'm trying to use to you know sell more goods or services of some sort um you know that decision makers you know, again, light bulb goes off, he or she is all excited and ready to go and, and, and gets get some of that machine learning going. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the next step might be, as uh, Sophie just said, to get uh, to get that that minimum, you know, uh, set up going to, to, you know, to prove the concept, you know, a proof of concept mm-hmm. type of project. Um, but then uh, once a, a, a basic sort of demo and example and and uh you know first full run through kind of happens then begins the process of okay how do we actually integrate this into um you know the real world of our production systems how do we how do we tie this in with an existing application or what new application do we need to build to uh include this this machine intelligence um how do we how do we bring together all the different sources of data to to do the real training for the real learning um when we create a model um, as a result of that training that learning you know and then we go and put it somewhere in production how do we funnel all the the real time real world data into that model so that the model you know does what it's supposed to do you know output you know results recommendations categorizations etc um so there's a lot of there's a lot of plumbing, right? There's a lot mm. of wiring up. There's a lot of connecting together that has to go on there, and that that um, really brings together, as Sophie mentioned, the, the 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 different the different functions, the different departments, the different stakeholders, and the you know in the company you probably have folks responsible for databases. You probably have folks you know responsible for I don't know connecting to outside feeds. Let's say you know we're talking about an application that depends on you know weather information or right. you know regulatory inputs, etc. So you have um, so to 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 support that cross functional coming together of many different things, uh, many different interests, many different technologies, many different uh, uh, you know just uh, t- types of data, types of functionality. Um, you need a, a, a base platform, a foundation that simplifies some of that, that, that makes some of those um, elements, you know, consistent and therefore, you know, more easily manipulable and more easily, um, you know, manageable at scale and so on. And that's, that's really what, what Red Hat brings to the, to the, to the table, both with the, 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 the lowest level um, foundational elements, such as the operating system, Red Hat Enterprise Linux and, um, and the cloud platform, OpenShift, um, Red Hat OpenShift Data Science takes that to the next level and starts to add in some of the learning specific capabilities to that platform so that you, again, unify this very disparate, heterogeneous uh, environment. Awesome. This platform gives us a way for developers and data scientists to work together, right? Like 
what other ways have they worked together in the past? I mean, if they didn't have a platform and we're working and we've given them one, what are we usually converting them off of? I guess it might be the right pain. question. Pain. Converting pain. them yeah. off of pain. No, I can believe that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think, Inter- um, interdisciplinary work is hard. <laughs> it is. And I think, you know, traditionally when we go into customers, we often see that data scientists are working in Jupyter notebook environments that are running on their own machine. So they right. can't. Yeah. scale up they can't scale out mm-hmm. um and when they do want to take whatever they've done and integrate it into a larger system to you know get this business intelligence then it is a very painful process um mm-hmm. we're not software engineers we don't have right. software engineering backgrounds as data scientists um and so often missing kind of the things that as developers, you two might see as sort of standard, not even best practices, just like the things that you always do, like know what's running in your environment, know which right. versions of things you have. As a data scientist, what we traditionally do is just install everything into one environment and it just <laughs> works. And then you hand it off to someone else and they mm-hmm. say, oh, I can't run this. I can't get this to work. I think what we're seeing now when we talk to a lot of our customers is that over the last kind of five years or so, they hired a load of data scientists because they thought there's so many places in our business where we can gain extra insights and value from data science, but they're just not seeing the payoff. They're just not seeing the results. And I think that's mainly because of lack of access to a collaborative platform that allows the data scientists to work in a way that's conducive to integrating into these larger applications. Yeah, and I th- this goes back to a story that I have, right? Like when I first worked with the data science team, right? We had to come up with that common language and we ended up you know, landing on that container file format as that common language to like, hey, you can make this run on your machine. If you can make that run on your machine, I can make it run anywhere kind of thing. And like that worked well, but it was very, very like education driven, right? Like I had to teach people, this is how, you know, containers work. This is how, you know, version control with containers works. all that stuff that like, you know, normally you would just install it all in your environment and off you go. Right. Now you have to put it in a container. That was, that took a lot of work, right? And I bet. And that's a, that's a tough line to toe as well, because. Yes. There's all of the benefits that containers and Kubernetes bring to standard application development. They bring to machine learning workloads as well, Mm -hmm. you know, scalability, flexibility, portability, security, all of this, we're happy. And you can explain that to a data scientist and they can say, fantastic. But then what's the next step? Do we want them to become container packaging experts? Do we, is that, you know, that's not, I think if you tell a group of data scientists we can solve all of your problems. All you need to do is write 20 pages of YAML. <laughs> then they're just going to cry. <laughs> um, so that's what we're really trying to extrapolate away from with Red Hat OpenShift Data Science. It's about reaping all of those benefits, the portability, the scalability, the best practices around managing environments, um, packages and libraries, and the access to the latest tools, whilst not having to care that it's running on some infrastructure somewhere. Right. I think something that that you both touched on that it really gets to the heart of what OpenShift Data Science is trying to do. And I just, you know, maybe I'm a little biased, but I would, I I think we've gone a long way. You, Sophie, and the the, the team uh, in, in working through what to put into OpenShift Data Science over the last a um, couple of years of work in the open source community. Um, uh, Chris, you mentioned, you know, uh, you know, getting this together and this together. And Sophie, you mentioned, you know, this library and that library and so on. A lot of um, the pain of setting up these kinds of environments uh, is, is about compatibility, right? Is about, mm-hmm. does this work with this? And when these two things are together, well, this third thing, what version does it have to be or what minimum sort of, you know, Mm -hmm. revision or or, or so on. By um, bringing together uh, the the elements of of a platform and 
kind of locking down or not locking down, but but kind of specifying and prepackaging um, sets of things that are known to work together where you don't have to mess with the, you know, well, what does the version of this, you know, is it compatible with the version of this? <clears throat> This is what OpenShift Data Science is doing. It's pulling together, right? It's starting with that sort of core of Jupyter Notebooks as the um, kind of the, the center of the, the 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 data science kind of you know you know workbench, if you will, right? And then uh, adds to it ways to pull in different data sources, right? Different kinds of data and bring that in for training. Um, plug into uh, model serving technology so that once a model is, is 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 built and tested and ready for the next level, it can be sort of shipped off to that um, next stage in the in the kind of the 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 workflow of of rolling software to to production within a given enterprise. Bringing all those pieces together, that data aggregation surrounding you know the the notebook and the outputs, you know the model serving, the model observation, the the, the model tuning lifecycle. Um, you know that 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 at the end of the day is the is the goal of OpenShift Data Science to to, to package up a, a number of those key pieces in an environment that the data scientist and the application development engineer um, can can work on without having to worry about wiring together all those supporting pieces. Yeah, and that kind of eases the flow of you know a data scientist's work to get into production, right? Like. That's, I mean, we talk about this all the time on the data services office hours. Sophie, the, the, how hard it is to get a trained model into production or get that experience into production. If Red Hat OpenShift data science is the way to do that, that's awesome, right? And the, the portability that it gives you, that, that's really great. But there's still something that has to happen to go from data scientists working to in development working and what is that like handoff point i guess is what i'm trying to get to i would say that um it, it's an interesting choice of word there handoff and i mm -hmm. i think um and sophie touched on this earlier in um referring yeah, I'm trying to, to drive home a point here soft, yeah. software uh, <laughs> engineers and hey data scientists aren't software engineers and mm -hmm. um obviously there's 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 different um there's vast domains of expertise on both sides what we're talking about here is where they overlap where they come together right. and maybe one of the early fallacies here was this notion of a of a of a one time handoff of it, mm. sort of like mm. okay, this this person this stage does this thing and whoop just throws it over the transom and it's caught on the other side and dealt with as a black box and and right. and move happily along. And to the extent that one can black box things, that's 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 great. That that provides some isolation and some some abstraction. But um, to the extent that um, let's say two adjacent um, phases in a workflow can um, better know about each other and better collaborate and better work together and have some rapid iteration between them rather than mm -hmm. a one-time, you know, you know, you know, big Once lump a quarter hand type off kind of thing. Yeah. Things can be made to work better. And part of, I think, what is being enabled here with, with OpenShift Data Science is, um, that opportunity for you know the sophies of the world to uh to to collaborate more tightly with um let's say application developers who don't know data science who have just enough of a sense of how data science can be added into their app and 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 um and and, and augment it and and have the the creative process have the the those two functions sort of work in tandem to really come up with that much more sort of effective powerful interesting differentiated a solution mm -hmm. so i don't know sophie i I'll, I'll, i'm a little baiting you there is that is that am i smoking something or is is there some reality there yeah i think you hit the nail on the head right and the the point i'm trying to drive home is that need for collaboration right like you have to enable the two teams to work together to for both teams to be successful uh you know going out and finding a lot of data points is great but unless you're actually doing something with it and you know using it some way, that's where the benefit is. So bringing together that pool of people or those two different, two usually different pools of people into the same place gives you that capability to be like, oh, cool, their thing's green, we can pull it in here now, you know, <laughs> and just 
add a little automation to it and off you go. It's, it's really kind of nice. There are lots of ways we can do analysis with data science. What are the use cases and how can someone be smart about addressing their needs and goals? That's for you, Sophie. <laughs> what are the use cases? Yeah, there's um, so many. Pick your favorite one, and <laughs> and and we can build from there because you know I think any any machine learning use case um, is uh, interesting in and of itself. But it's just amazing how you can just roll back the camera just a little bit and realize, well, wow, that pattern applies in so many other areas. Right. So I'm really interested in recommendation engines. So mm -hmm. from, you know, when we launch our favorite application that streams films and TV and it recommends things to us through to uh, music recommendations on music streaming apps, through to what to purchase on e-retailers, they're all kind of the same variety. You know, they're all making recommendations. They're all right. in the same category, but it's applied to arguably a range of different um, verticals. Um, and also their goals are slightly different. So, you know, when it's on a e-retailer, then it's, can we get you to spend more money? Um, when it's on a TV streaming website it's can we get you to have a nice time today it's not like you know you're still paying for the subscription but mm -hmm. you've got to think about what uh what you want to achieve and I think that's really important in machine learning there's often this notion that models are magical and I'm just going to create a model that's like 99.9% .9 accurate and then it's going to be fantastic but actually stepping back and thinking okay what does 99.9% .9 accurate mean mm. does that mean it's wrong one time in every a thousand depending on the use case that could be fatal um right <laughs> right yeah I want, and, I want something a little better than that in my art traffic control system right <laughs> right exactly and so then kind of always keeping the the specific use case in mind thinking what can we leverage from things we already know and how can we do this sensibly you know if you just take an off-the-shelf machine learning uh, recommendation engine which you could go and train today on some data that you can download from the internet in you know five minutes using some machine learning library really a low code solution there nothing that I would be writing myself from scratch then it could recommend films to me right. movies as you all call them <laughs> well maybe uh, Probably not bad ones. On mm. on a base level, these these algorithms are pretty good. They're pretty mm. clever. But mm. if there's a load of Christmas holiday holiday movies in this mm. database, and um, somebody who had very similar viewing behavior to me in the past and liked the same thing, also liked a lot of holiday movies, they're going to recommend the holiday movies to me. Now as sensible adults we might say October 7th that's a bit early for holiday movies I wait until at least October the 8th before I start watching those right so I think it's about you've always got to remember the machine is only as clever as the information that you tell it so keep your use case in mind mm -hmm. make sure that you sanity check these things and make sure that you know the predictions that it's giving are sensible you've got to be ethical and responsible about what you're doing with machine learning um, and that's a whole nother bag of yeah things but you've also just got to not be stupid and not think that machine learning is going to solve all your problems like this because it might not Exactly. It's not a magic wand, right? Like I think, I think people realize that by now. Um, Mike, where are some success cases in Red Hat that we've, you know, applied some data science and yeah, I, I think the, um, I, I think the recommendation engine is a, is a, is a great starting point, a great example. And, and um, we haven't actually talked about that um, answered together, Sophie, that particular question, but it, I'm encouraged that, uh, um, the, the canonical example that I've always used in my own mind uh, in understanding this is is the recommendation engine, right? You, everybody has um, an experience, like whether it's you know books on Amazon or or movies on Netflix, of of being sort of 
recommended something and anybody who's read into that a little bit and understand even the, the most at the most basic level how that works you know the basics of you know linear regression and and um basically determining what factors um with what weightings are associated with what likelihood of of um you know a, 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 a propensity to, to to buy or like a given thing and then how you you know the math that that um, you set up to capture that and, and, and turn that into a quote unquote model. Um, you know, I think that's the, that's, that's, that's the great starting point to, to, to get one's head around how, how this all works. And most of the rest of machine learning, um, algorithms and examples are, you know, more complex variants of that. And one of the, the bits of magic or, or not magic, one of the things that I think is so much the opportunity to, um, to, to get better at and and to empower enterprises to make really sophisticated use of this stuff is, um, you know, as, as Sophie said, you've got to not be stupid about it. And one way that that is um, stupidity or not is manifested is in, well, what what things do you look at? What aspects does does one look at to consider as um, as 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 inputs as components as, uh, as as contributing factors to um, the likelihood of something being you know liked or or or, or so on um, and you know okay if you sit down with something kind of straightforward and understandable like recommending books well you might think of all kinds of demographic things like you know you know age and sort of you know geographical provenance and um you know education level and you know um you know along with of course previous choices right but all these these other um characteristics that you know you can train and, and model and 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 make make uh, the the uh, the ultimate recommendation engine more sophisticated um i think the enabling uh the domain people and the data working with the, the specific data scientists to explore wow what are other factors to consider and you know how can we how can we come up with a better recommendation engine because we took into account things that our competitors didn't i think that um that is uh a a, a place of, of of great research so now to after all that <laughs> preface Fine. to come back to your actual question of where are we seeing some success I think an interesting area where um, we have have seen some success is in manufacturing, mm -hmm. um, and in applying this idea, this this approach of um, you know recommendation engine type thinking of of um, you know um, you know regression and figuring out what factors are important to result in an optimal outcome type thinking. Um, to manage, let's say, layouts of shop floors, to manage, you know, workflows of assembly lines, to manage supply chains, right? Any any manufactured good these days depends on um, incredibly complex sources of, of um, you know, constituent components coming from, you know, all over the planet, you know, if they're not, you know, stuck in a, on a container ship in a seaport somewhere right now. But anyway, <laughs> these, um, the, the complexity of, uh, of topologies like that and the way that one can um, experiment with uh, uh, representing those in ways that can uh, then be amenable to training and then ultimately, um, you know, a, a model put into production to optimize, uh, you know, how things are done, when things are done, how things are sequenced. I think that's a, 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 a really interesting example. And for, for whatever reason, uh, manufacturing has been uh, has been one of the areas where we've gotten a lot of traction. Sophie, I know you've been involved in a number of those projects. Maybe you can even share some some, without naming names, of course. You know some of the some of the interesting aspects that you experienced as you dug in into those projects. Yeah, so I think the the thing I want to emphasize here is that we at Red Hat don't actually do the data science. We just right. enable our customers to be able to go and do it through our platform. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, I love that seeing the data scientists become more effective and, you know, seeing their work put through to fruition, whatever the vertical may be. Um, one use case that stands out to me is some work we did, um, to enable one of our healthcare customers to detect sepsis earlier. Oh, wow. Um, so sepsis is, uh, a, a very bad infection and yes. the sooner it is caught, uh, the better. 
um, the better the outcome. And so traditionally this was done through, you know, human checks, et cetera. Um, and by centralizing that data that was collected and using it to make predictions, they were able to reduce the time to diagnosis of sepsis by six hours. Wow. So this had a really positive impact on people's outcomes. Now, obviously yeah. not all AI and machine learning is quite so uh, heroic, but uh, yeah, no, but that's I a, like that that's use a, case. Yeah, that's a great one. And, you know, it kind of takes us to, you know, you can use it in manufacturing, healthcare, automotive, finance, you know, everything, right? Like there's, you know, adding, you know, changing the oil does what to the machine, right? Like you need data for that. And, you know, you need to crunch that data. And there's applications that can be different verticals that can take advantage of these. Like what's, it, it, you know, if, if I'm an AI and I'm saying that's a nice dog to pet, like that's probably a good use for AI, in my opinion, because I like petting dogs. Um, and Sophie, I know you do too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but there's there's so many different verticals. You know, you mentioned healthcare, but you know everything from automotive to transportation to self healing infrastructure. Right? There's a wild, wide gamut of things that can be done with the right science. Right? With the right math essentially um so it's pretty cool to hear that use case to be honest with you i think it's a great use case in that it exemplifies a whole a whole class of um of of, of problems that are at the surface very different but yet mm -hmm. in terms of how one applies machine learning to them and the actual math going on under the hood it's kind it's very similar right so uh, you 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 mentioned you know you know dog uh, you know best best dog to pet and you know the sort of the identifying cats and images is one of the, the sort of the classic um, you know uh, like uh, sort of you know machine learning one hundred and one uh, tutorials mm -hmm. to, to to go through, but yet um, training uh, an algorithm to identify cats is at the end of the day the same process the same math the same type of model as um, looking at x-rays and identifying, you know, anomalies that are right. uh, associated with, you know, certain, you know, diseases or, um, you know, I, I think, uh, and, and more generally, it doesn't even have to be images, right? Whether the data is, you know, uh, time series data, uh, you know, um, uh, status checks on some kind of machinery or, mm -hmm sound data versus, you know, audio data versus, versus, uh, you know, you know, video data or, or picture data. Um, you know, the, the, the notion of finding common patterns and then associating those patterns with, you know, good, bad, you know, yes, no, um, recommend A, B, C, or D, uh, the, 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 the way you set up an environment, the way you, um, take the data that's coming in and train the model. And then the way you go push that model out to production is, is very similar for all of those, um, all of those types of use cases. So I, I think, uh, that kind of, um, again, whether it's super simple, like yes, no, or more complex, like which of N categories does, does a given thing fall into, um, that, that those, those, um, identifying things in, in, uh, in, 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 again, pictures, video, uh, uh, audio, um, other time series data is a, 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 a huge and powerful area of opportunity for, um, enterprises to, uh, to put machine learning in action. Right. There's a lot of repeatable processes and pipeline stages kind of throughout machine learning regardless of the use case so perhaps you're thinking oh I'd like to do this but it sounds like a huge task well there's probably somebody out there in the open source world that's already done exactly the same thing or something very similar and you can you know you can use their patterns um, and learn from that one of the use case that I just want to uh, quickly draw attention to that I think often gets overlooked so perhaps you're listening to this and thinking or oh, I'm not in a position where I feel, you know, able or ready to uh, put machine learning into my core business functionality. There's too much writing on this. We know what we do. It works. But any, any business that has customers 
the customer experience can be improved through AI and machine learning, be it predicting wait times for a restaurant uh, when you call up and say, hey, can I get a table for six? How long is it going to be? Be it um, predicting um, who you should route directly to a real human when they ring in with a complaint about something. Any human experience that you are responsible for could be improved by machine learning. And so perhaps that's somewhere to start. That's profound, almost. Um, <laughs> I mean, but to think about it, right? Like Did we any, say profound? <laughs> I mean, anywhere a person's making a decision or some, you know, math has to be done, it's a better place for AI to do it. That's pretty cool to think of, right? Right? Like the, and the fact that somebody might have already done the hard part for me, I just need to apply it. Uh, that's, that's awesome. Um, and what I, what I think people, many don't um, immediately grok as they get into this is that at the end of the day, you know, that's th that improve the customer experience thing. It's just another variant of the recommendation engine, right? Mm -hmm. It's a matter of, of training a model that understands, you know, a, a bunch of factors, a bunch of characteristics, a bunch of attributes, you know, wait time, uh, number of mouse clicks, uh, you know, color of screen, you know, you know, size of buttons, font of the text on the page, pick any of a zillion different factors and just let let the machine crunch the math saying, OK, with, with these um, values for all of these variables, um, you know, person liked or didn't like the experience, you know, had a good or bad experience, push the red, yellow or green button when they when they were all done saying they like this crunch enough of that data and and you know you can you can come up with a pretty sophisticated system that understands that okay a, a person in this category trying to find this type of thing we're going to tailor the environment in this way and we're 90 whatever percent confident they're going to have um, a super cool experience at the end of the day the, the 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 math and the stuff going on underneath is this the same basic thing as the amazon book recommender <laughs> Interesting. So let's shift gears a little bit here. Um, it'd be great to know when things are about to break. And when I say things, I mean like physical or virtual things, anything. What does uh, applied predictive analysis look like? Sophie, I'll let you start on that one. <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, so, you know, if we're just talking how do we learn when things will break and fail? That's certainly something that we can monitor for using machine learning. So, you know, perhaps I run a factory and it has many pieces of moving parts and I save more money by bringing a machine down for an hour before it breaks to replace a part than I do if I wait until it breaks and then someone's got to order the part and everything's unexpectedly stopped. Um, so certainly, you know, false uh, prediction and predictive maintenance is a classic machine learning use case um, and something that certainly our customers have seen success with. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I'd heard a statistic like this before and I just quickly uh, Googled it up here. I can't speak to the accuracy of the background but this at least within an order of magnitude you know gives it gives a sense of what's going on here okay. um jet engines uh will collect information at a rate of something like five thousand data points per second right um, Sounds about this right. particular uh this particular blurb here saying a boeing 787 generates on average 500 gigabytes of system data in a flight um wow. An Airbus A380 is fitted with as many as 25,000 sensors, right? So when you start thinking about, um, you know, the amount of data being produced from all these different sensors, um, and then the uh, ability to, um, uh, to to amass all that data, and then and then do, you know, correlations, that same kind of regression with, okay, when there's a failure, what were the variable, you know, what were the values of, you know you know, the most important, you know, 23,000 of those 25,000 sensors and what seems to have um, been most highly correlated with that particular type of problem, you build up enough of that data, then in real time, monitoring all those sensors, you can start to see, you know, things trending toward a, an increased likelihood of a certain type of failure and then obviously take, you know, preemptive steps. Um, 
that sort of infusion of 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 sensors and the ability to co- collect data and then and then um you know train models against that is uh is just continuing to to grow explosively i'll say in in terms of the ways in which it's applied in various industries and and the value that's being um you know gotten from from that increased ability to observe and predict awesome so you know i live outside of detroit you know the machinery robot conversation is a good one for me i actually live uh in a stretch of land called automation alley um which i think is funny because when i think of automation i think of like computer automation but they're saying no 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 robots (laughs) um how much automation comes into play with ai and ml i mean once you train a model is it just kind of like set it and forget it like the the weird ovens back in the day or is there constant tinkering that needs to happen drift sophie tell us about drift yeah so if we for for argument's sake let's do something i don't like doing and just think of a machine learning model as just a black box data comes in and a prediction comes out Mm -hmm. you can continue passing data in it's going to continue spitting a prediction out but if the data that the black box model was trained on becomes notably different from the data that is now being inputted Mm. then your prediction is going to be wrong right but the question is will you notice Uh, it's still giving you a prediction right um black box is still doing the same thing it was doing right listen to black box so how are we gonna know that the prediction isn't any good and particularly in cases when you don't have the truth you know you're making a prediction because you want to predict something if we already knew the answer we wouldn't need the model at all like i said when you know when you're training a model and someone might say oh it needs to be 99.5 percent accurate you've got your training data it's labeled you know the truth but that truth goes out the window once you put this thing into production so essentially this is what we call a uh, data drift or you can look at it from a different angle and it can be thought of as model drift a slightly different scenario but essentially when the data that you trained the model on is no longer representative of the data that you're making predictions on then you've likely got a problem so we absolutely cannot just put a model out there and say okay, we'll leave this there for 30 years. Um, (laughs) It's really important to monitor these models. Mm. So this involves data scientists, but this model is already part of an application. So I think this goes back to the fact that we need collaboration throughout this process between data scientists and app devs. These cross-functional teams can't just stop communicating once that model's up and running. And, you know, what we do uh, and what we recommend to our customers is that you monitor as much as you can. So just in the same way we'd monitor a standard application to see how much memory it's using, how long it's taking for data to pass through the system, we can do all of that. But we can also monitor the distribution of data coming in. So what does the data coming in look like? If that notably changes over time, then that implies that our model might have gone wrong. Similarly, we can also model the types of predictions that the model is making. We can monitor those. So if we see that uh, our model was predicting um, one in every 100 transactions by some merchant to be fraudulent, And then all of a sudden that shoots up to six in every 100. Something has changed. You know, why has that happened? Now, it might just be that this merchant got more fraudulent, but it might be that something has changed, be it our data ingestion, be it the type of data. Mm. So model retraining is really important. And there's many cases where you can automatically retrain the model. So it might be that you want to automatically retrain your model every day at the end of a service if you run a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Or it might be that you want to keep with the same model 
until it looks like your data has drifted. So perhaps you trained your model um, to tell you how many servers you need tomorrow and what shifts mm -hmm. on the data from a month ago. But a month ago was December and now it's mid-January and no one's right. coming to the restaurant. You'd want to retrain. You'd want to use mm -hmm. different data. So I think monitoring um, to making sure that things are still going as expected is really important. A lot of that can be automated, but I think you still want a human in the loop. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I need a human in the loop for sure. Mike, any follow up or? Yeah, you know, the, the human in the loop thing, I think is, an imp is a really important point that again, is maybe not fully appreciated um, as, as somebody it's starting to be learned, I feel jumps like. into yeah. the world of machine learning with certain expectations about what it can and can't do. Um, and, and, and it's important to keep in mind that in, in so many cases, machine learning's value is not in that it completely automates something so that it's it's hands off it's that it automates enough of the right things that um the human involvement is narrowed to be where human judgment is still um in, important and and an and valuable and a differentiator and so that combination of what the machine learning has automated with ongoing you know human judgment is is still uh, an important overall sort of let's say characteristic of 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 you know the system at play so for example like we were talking about the sepsis and in general um using uh I, you know identification of uh anomalous um artifacts and whether it's x-rays or any sort of other medical data um the i would say in very few cases does um is something like that left, you know, completely to the machine and the machine decides, oh, you have, you know, sepsis or oh, you have pneumonia or you have whatever. And, you know, the, the, the patient gets checked, you know, checked out and, and sent to the, you know, prescription department or the, the operating room by, by the machine. It's like, no, what that machine learning algorithm is doing there is aiding the, the, the doctor or the nurse or the, you know, the, the specialist um, by taking what would have been a laborious, time consuming, you know, analysis or, or review of data um, and uh, it, getting them on the right path much sooner so that they can look more carefully at a particular area of anomaly or a particular, let's say, uh, subset of potential, you know, diseases um, and, and focus their efforts uh, sort of more optimally. That, that kind of augmented decision making is, I think, a, a, a super important and may very well be majority of, of of um of uh of of use cases out there for machine learning uh sophie does that resonate um yeah i think it's about you know letting it lets data scientists focus on the things that they want to as well and the interesting things it's getting rid of the arguably manual processes that we don't want to do or don't need to do mm -hmm. yeah so we're coming up on time here and we have another show at the top of the hour. So let's, let's ask a quote closing question here. What gets you up in the morning? What gets you out of bed and like makes you excited for the day ahead? All right. Sophie, you go first this time. <laughs> well, I feel like you're going to come out with a really, you know, wise answer, really kind of academic. Um, but I'm going to have to tell you that the thing that gets me out of bed in the morning is that my yoga instructor does an early morning yoga class and she brings her two dogs with her. Are so, they, can you pet them? Do you have the, I, oh, you absolutely can okay. pet them. My favorite pastime is moving their bed to right next to my yoga mat. So we can uh -huh. just sit and have a little cuddle whilst everyone else does yoga. So really it's, it's the, the thought of petting dogs, um, gets me the, out the of thought bed of petting in good dogs yeah so the dog, they were all good dogs they're all good dogs yes exactly mike what yeah. about you yeah. oh wow now, 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 now i have the opposite problem yeah, that's, a challenge. that's too yeah. cool that's real life I mean, <laughs> the best the best you know to 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 put something out there in a similar spirit i i, I don't get to do it every day but when it gets me out of bed the, the equivalent thing is uh i like to sail i'm a sailor and um when i uh when i 
wake up on on the boat, whether it's in the marina or you know anchored somewhere wonderful the the, the sound of seagulls and water gently lapping at the the hull and the pilings or or rocks or, or whatever's happening happening to be around um that is uh that is uh that is my ideal what uh gets me out of bed now in a um i'll say a maybe uh just to complement that with something uh i'll say you know more abstract um i really am still very much excited about the the potential for all of the technologies we've been talking about here the the potential of machine learning to um to to accelerate to enhance to augment uh so many so many different things i mean i think um from the very first time that i experienced a recommendation engine um and it probably was amazon um through to you know the first time somebody showed me you know pandora and they're like oh it's still figure out what you know what you you know what you'll uh you know what you'll most like based on some examples that you give it so i immediately had to be a smart ass and put in you know metallica and mahler and i have to say i was blown away by the 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 range of interesting uh sort of uh bits of music that came out of its uh uh you know assumptions of what i might like given what it thought were the important characteristics of uh, of, of those those artists um you know i think as we uh continue to again apply these uh whether it's recommendation engine or whether it's um object recognition recognition pattern recognition in in um you know uh, images or sound or time series data um the more we apply that to the more different um you know domains i think the more optimized and good feeling uh, so many aspects of our lives will be. And I think the work that we're doing here with uh, OpenShift Data Science is, um, you know, is a, is, a, is a contribution to that. I, that and, and being part of that, I know it's maybe in the grand scheme of all the algorithms out there and all the, 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 the great AI companies out there, um, it's maybe a small thing, but I, I am really excited about that, you know, contribution to, you know, the advancement of, uh, of, of doing machine learning. So. I'll leave you with that. <laughs> That's fantastic. Sophie, Mike, thank you so much for joining me today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, audience, for watching. Uh, this has been a great show. I think a lot of people will realize that collaboration is key when it comes to data science, like a lot of things. So thank you for the conversation. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks for having us, Chris. Anytime. Yep. Coming up Thanks. next, the Rail Presents show. So stick around, folks. And I'll be queuing that up in just a second.